Andrew Womack Ministries presents this message titled, What Happened to the Old Man? We pray that the Word of God will come alive in your heart as you listen. Praise the Lord. Let me real briefly just refresh your memory on what we started uh, teaching on. We started, uh, well anyway, this is our third week to be dealing on the subject of spirit, soul, and body. And actually... We uh, laid a groundwork teaching about spirit, soul, and body. We're going to go beyond that, and the thrust of this is going to be to teach our right standing with the Lord uh, and show us how God views us, how we're clean and righteous in His sight. The Bible says, how can two walk together except they be agreed? And most of us don't see ourselves the way that God has really made us through the Lord Jesus, so that's what all of this teaching is about. It's a teaching on righteousness, our position in the Lord. The very first week, we just laid some foundation about spirit, soul, and body, that we do have a spirit, soul, and body. We talked about that it's your spirit that gets born again, not your soul and not your body. And if you'll uh, receive that truth, it'll answer a tremendous amount of questions for you. Because this is the reason that after you commit your life to the Lord and after you perceive a tremendous change in your life, there may not be an outward change that matches up with what you feel on the inside because the... uh, Salvation that takes place in your spirit is instantaneous and it's complete, but then the rest of it is only uh, manifest as you renew your mind and as you appropriate it. In other words, you can be born again and yet not reflect it in your outer man if you don't renew your mind. We also talked about that the entire Christian life is basically a renewing of our mind, a learning of what we received when we received salvation. It is not going out and trying to obtain things from God. I'd really like to go back and reteach all this because I know not everybody was here, but if you've missed any of these uh, points that we've made, this is just crucial. I think that these are some of the most misunderstood things in Christianity. Most people are, are uh, petitioning the Lord, asking for faith, when the truth is that you've got all of the faith that you'll ever need or that you'll ever get. It's already there in your born-again person. We petition the Lord for healing, for anointing, for all of these things. They're already resident on the inside of us in our spirit. Our spirit was completely changed. Our spirit is brand new. It has everything in it it will ever have. Your spirit is right this moment the same spirit that you'll have throughout all eternity. Your salvation is one-third complete. In your spirit, you are completely saved. There's nothing left to do. The rest of the Christian life is renewing your mind to what happened to you in the spirit and then walking it out. And if people could get hold of that concept, man, it makes the Christian life a thousand times easier. One real brief application is that uh, back in Seagaville days, I think Don was with us back then, but Joshua had a uh, thing that came on him one year and we thought he was going to die. He had been three days and he was nine months old without any food and he wouldn't move or anything. He had an extremely high temperature. We didn't take him to the doctor to find out what was wrong, but he was in really bad shape. And we prayed over him, and it was just a miracle that he came through that thing. Well, the next year, at the exact same day, uh, just a couple of days before Christmas, the exact same thing started happening to him again. And uh, I don't know why, but with Joshua, there were things that came back every year. He fell and hit his ear one year and, and raised a knot on it. And for 10 years, on the exact same day, that knot had come back every year, and we'd pray over that thing. But anyway, this... Sickness started to come back on Josh this second year, and I could see it coming. And boy, I started fighting that thing. I started praying and fasting. I mean, resisting because he came close to dying is what it looked like to us, and we were determined to stop that. And as I was praying about it, I was saying, God, I know that you've healed uh, Joshua. I said, what's the problem? Why, why is all of this happening? And the Lord spoke to me a real simple principle. He said, you're fighting to get healed instead of fighting because you are healed which may not make much difference to you, but what it did to me, see, it totally changed my attitude because I was maintaining this position that here we are sick and we need to get over there well. And see, when you identify with sickness, you're already accepting sickness. You've already received it. It's easier to reject something than it is to receive it and then get rid of it. But see, if you accept it and say, well, I'm sick and God, I've got to get healed, well, then you're already starting from a position of defeat trying to go under victory. But when you get this attitude that, no, by the stripes of Jesus, I was healed, it's already been done, and I'm already healed, and this is Satan trying to steal from me what is mine. It's easier to defend something than it is to go out and obtain and win, possess something. And that attitude difference just totally changed me. I mean, the moment I saw that, I boy, we're already healed. By the stripes of Jesus, Joshua's already been healed. Man, I got up and rebuked the devil, said the same thing I'd been doing before, but with a different attitude. 
now, not trying it to see if it'll work. See, that's already got an element of doubt in it. Is it going to work? Well, there's no way you can doubt. Is it going to work if you believe it's already worked, if it's already accomplished, if it's already done? I've already been healed, and Satan just tries to steal from me every once in a while what's already mine. And when I got that attitude difference in 10 minutes' time, Joshua was, was healed and everything was over with. So see, I believe understanding that your salvation is complete and that in Christ Jesus you are not trying, you are not the defeated over here trying to obtain unto victory, but you are already victorious in Christ Jesus and Satan is trying to bring things against you to stop what God's already given you from coming out. When you see that, boy, it changes your attitude. Uh, another illustration of this is that if you had, somebody told you if you had a million dollars buried in your backyard, and you didn't know where it was, you didn't know how deep it was, but you knew there was a million dollars buried in your backyard somewhere. If you know, if you really knew that it was there beyond any shadow of a doubt, regardless what obstacles you had to go through, if there were rocks in the yard or whatever, you would dig and it would keep you motivated and you would stick with it until you found that if you knew beyond any shadow of a doubt that it was there. But if somebody just told you that and you weren't sure whether it was real, you were just going to try it, I guarantee you, you go out there and work half a day and get hot and sweaty and, a, and a, run into a bunch of rocks or something like this, and if you weren't 100% convinced that it was already there, your motivation would lag. Most people would say, I just don't think it's worth the effort. I don't even know if it's there. Well, see, that's kind of the attitude that we've had many times with healing, with deliverance, with all of the things of the Lord. We sometimes wonder if it's really going to happen, but when you begin to start getting hold of this concept that we're talking about, that in Christ Jesus, your spirit, you've already received everything. It's complete. It's pure. It's got everything you'll ever need in it. Well, then it just keeps me going. It doesn't matter what, how much effort it takes. It doesn't matter what I've got to go through. I know that in Christ Jesus, I've already got the victory, and I'm not going to quit until I come up with it. Amen. For it provides me with motivation. The more you know, the easier it is to dig out and get out what God has put within you. But if you don't know very much, if you just knew this, that in Christ Jesus I've already got all of the answers, that it's already within me, I am victorious, you just keep after it until eventually you won. And you know, Jamie and I, when we first got turned on to the Lord, we saw many, many miracles happen that there was no justification for it except that we had this knowledge. We knew that we were overcomers. We knew we were victorious. We didn't know about confession. We didn't know about any of those things. We'd never heard of Copenhagen, Copeland and Hagen. We'd never heard of any of these things, but we had certainly learned that we had the victory in us and we just weren't going to quit. And man, we won a lot of things because we just outlasted the devil. We didn't quit. We won by default. Amen. Even an old blind hog, if it keeps rooting long enough to come up with something, amen, that determination is worth a lot. <laughs> and man, we were determined, so it worked. So anyway, we've been talking about this. It's your spirit, the part of you that got born again. Your spirit is complete. In Christ Jesus, you've got all of the power. You've got the same faith that Jesus had. I'll be explaining that as we go on through this series. You've got the same knowledge that Jesus has. You've got the same everything. Some of you look at me like, Brother, you are out of touch with reality or something. I can guarantee you I don't have the same faith that Jesus has. I operate in defeat, etc. Well, see, this is one of the benefits of ministering on spirit, soul, and body is to make you aware that there is a spirit part of you that most of us don't know. If you want to see your physical part, you can either look at your hand or go look in a mirror. If you want to find out what you're thinking, your emotional realm, you can sit back and you're in touch with your emotions, your feelings. But did you know that there's a spirit part of you that you cannot see in a mirror? You can't feel through your emotions. The only way to perceive what your spirit's like is to look in God's Word. John 6, 63 says, The words that I speak unto you they are spirit and they are life. God's Word is just like holding a mirror up in front of you. And as you read it and it tells you that you are righteous, that the same power that raised Jesus Christ from the dead is now resident on the inside of you out of Ephesians chapter 1. When you read that, that's what's true in your spirit. You may not feel it. You certainly can't see it. But you begin to believe it. And what you do by believing it, you draw out that power on the inside of you. So the teaching on spirit's own body will make you conscious that there's another part of you that most of us don't even consider. Many times we just go by our feeling, the emotional realm. You feel depressed, and so you think, well, that's the way I feel, so that's the way that I am. No, you got another part of you, your spirit, that's always in right standing with God. It's always rejoicing. It's always praising God. Your spirit doesn't have pity parties. It doesn't have blue Mondays. It doesn't get depressed. It doesn't get discouraged. Your spirit is 100% of the time in union with God, on track with God, and it's always on top. Amen?
we really started dealing with this last week and we talked about that your um, old man is dead and gone and I know that some of you that may blow your theology but we've already dealt with that. Anyway, what I want to do today is to just back up a second. Somebody, if you've listened to what I said, may have a few questions from Scripture about this saying, man, I'm not sure that your spirit is complete. There's only two scriptures out of all of the word that I've seen that really uh, look contradictory to that, and that's what I want to deal with this morning and explain those scriptures in case anybody has uh, been familiar with these. Out of 2 Corinthians chapter 7 and verse 1, he says, Having therefore these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit, perfecting holiness in the fear of God. Now, this is talking about cleansing ourselves from all filthiness of the flesh and spirit. Now, that right there would imply that your spirit can be filthy, which would contradict what I'm talking about. But let's look at it in context. In uh, the seventh chapter, verse 1, it says, Having therefore, and this word therefore, every time you see it, ties this statement in with what was just said before. Having therefore these promises. What promises are they? Well, if you back up into the sixth chapter, actually you could back up all the way into the fifth chapter where we started our teaching talking about in verse 17 that if you're in Christ, you're a new creature. Old things will pass away, all things will become new. But in the latter part of the sixth chapter, he talks about separating yourself from ungodliness. Verse 14, 2 Corinthians 6, 14, it says, Be ye not unequally yoked together with unbelievers, for what fellowship hath righteousness with unrighteousness? And what communion hath light with darkness? And what concord hath Christ with Belial? Or what part hath he that believeth with an infidel? And what agreement hath the temple of God with idols? For ye are the temple of the living God. As God has said, I will dwell in them and walk in them, and I will be their God, and they shall be my people. Wherefore, now this is the promise that chapter 7 is referring to. Wherefore, come out from among them, and be ye separate, saith the Lord, and touch not the unclean thing, and I will receive you, and will be a father unto you, and ye shall be my sons and daughters, saith the Lord Almighty. Having therefore these promises, these promises of separating yourself, coming out from among people who are operating in the defilement and the ungodliness of this world, having these promises, dearly beloved, let us cleanse ourselves from, it didn't say of, it didn't say cleanse yourself of the filthiness of the flesh and spirit, but from the filthiness of the flesh and spirit. And so what this is talking about, this is not talking about your flesh and your spirit being defiled, but it's talking about withdrawing from other people, not only physically, but even spiritually, breaking that bondage and stuff that can come at you and can contaminate you. This is not a scripture that is talking about your spirit being contaminated. Your spirit cannot be contaminated once you get born again. Your spirit is righteous and holy. Again, if any of you missed this teaching, I've already used these scriptures, but out of Ephesians chapter 4, verse 24, it says, Put on the new man, which after God is created in righteousness and true holiness. Your spirit, when you get born again, is righteous and truly holy, implying that there may be a, a different type of holiness that is not God's standard, but the holiness that's in your spirit is now the true righteousness of God. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, For God the Father made Jesus, who knew no sin, to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in Christ Jesus. Your spirit part of you is truly righteous and holy. 1 John chapter 4, verse 17 says, Herein is our love made perfect, that we may have boldness in the day of judgment, because as he is, speaking of God the Father, Jesus is who he's talking about, as he is, so are we in this world. Amen. Not so are we going to be, but so are we in this world. Now that's not talking about your physical body, because your physical body is not as his physical body. He's got a glorified body now that's able to walk through walls and do all of these things. Uh, our soul isn't like he is yet. That's got to be talking about your spirit. Your spirit is as he is. What's a tremendous statement. Y'all are looking at me funny. Either I'm giving too much to you at one time or something, but you need to get hold of this. It's your spirit is as Jesus is. Boy, that's tremendous. You know, that's the reason that religion so many times is so detrimental to true Christianity because religion, see, doesn't teach that through the new birth, You've been recreated in the image of God and that your spirit part of you is as he is. They don't teach that. Instead, they teach that God's way up here, holy, just God, and here's sinful man down here. 
Well, now that's a true statement, except that the blood of the Lord Jesus Christ wiped out this gulf that was between us. It tore down the wall of partition that was between us, and it made us a brand new creation that is just as capable right this moment of fellowshipping with God as you'll ever be capable of fellowshipping with God throughout all eternity. Your spirit isn't going to be improved. It's not going to be cleansed and perfected. It's already that way. It's your soul and your body that's going to be changed when we go to be with the Lord. But your spirit is right now as Jesus is in this world. You know, if you really believe that, I guarantee you, you would not approach the problems that Satan brings at you with a defeated attitude the way most of us do. This would just totally do away with the failure syndrome with this unworthiness that keeps us from being able to accomplish anything from the Lord. And it'd give you a superiority attitude. Amen? I mean, a godly type of superiority attitude. Superior to any weapon that the devil forms against you. No weapon formed against you will prosper. You'll never understand true authority in, of the believer, authority in Christ Jesus, if you don't understand that your spirit's been made righteous and that you are in right standing with God. Amen? Let's look at another scripture on this. 1 John chapter 3. This scripture used to give me problems for a long, long time, and now it's actually become a scripture that uh, is just a tremendous encouragement. 1 John chapter 3, in verse 9, it says, Whosoever is born of God doth not commit sin, for his seed remaineth in him, and he cannot sin because he is born of God. Now, how do you understand the scripture like that? I mean, that scripture looks like it is just totally out of context with our lives, that there's no way to make this consistent with our lives. It says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin. Are there any of you in here that commit sin? Are you born of God? Well, see, you could take this scripture and say, now, wait a minute. This scripture says if you're born of God, you don't commit sin. So if you sin, you aren't born of God. You didn't get the real thing. See, this could be a very confusing passage of scripture. Well, there's a number of ways to interpret this. One way is some people preach that you reach this place where you actually reach sinless perfection. They call it sanctification, lots of other kinds of things, but they, reach, they believe that they reach a place where it's impossible for them to sin that they just got their act together. I've met some people like that that told me that they had reached sanctification. And you know those people, man, I can, I can teach exactly like I'm teaching this morning and get them so mad at me that they'll sin. I can prove <laughs> that they have not reached sinless perfection. I can needle those people long enough till one of them wants to pop me in the nose and they've sinned, and we can disprove that theory by just practical application. You do not reach a place where it's impossible to sin. Matter of fact, the very context of this scripture, 1 John chapter 1, says in verse 7, well, that's verse 8, it says, If we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. Verse 10, If we say that we have not sinned, we make him a liar, and his word is not in us. Chapter 2, verse 1 says, My little children, these things write I unto you that you sin not. But if any man sins, we have an advocate with the Father. So there's three proofs in the same context, the same author writing that Christians do sin. He was writing to my little children. He was writing to believers. And yet he said that if you say you don't sin, you're a liar and the truth isn't in you. Now that looks like a direct contradiction to what he said in chapter 3, verse 9, where whosoever is not is born of God, does not commit sin. And yet we know that the Scripture didn't contradict itself. We know that John didn't contradict himself. And so how do you harmonize it? Well, here's another way that uh, people have tried to harmonize, and this is what I was taught all of my life, is that this is talking about habitual sin. You will not habitually sin. You may sin, but you won't habitually sin. When you get born again, you may sin a few times, but you will just not consistently live in it. Like if you were an alcoholic before you got saved, You may fall and sin once or twice, but if you continue to be an alcoholic, you aren't truly born of God. You know, I can agree with that in principle, that I do believe that when you get born again, there's a change that takes place, and that change will sooner or later affect the outside. And a person with no visible effects of salvation in their life would sure make me question whether they're born again. But technically speaking, it's possible to get born again and continue to be an alcoholic. I don't believe it should be that way, it, and it usually isn't that way, but I think it's possible to be that way. Now, some people, see, would say, no, that's what this verse is saying. It says, whosoever is born of God cannot habitually practice sin. And so, that's just impossible. You can't live that way. 
Well, it depend, depends on what you consider sin. I mean, if you call adultery, fornication, alcoholism, drug abuse, if those are what you consider sin and plug into that verse, you may be able to apply that and make it work. But if you use the Bible definition of sin out of James chapter 4, verse 17, where it says, Therefore, to him that knows to do good and does it not to him it is sin, then that means there's not a one of us that could live under that kind of doctrine. Because that means that if you know that you're supposed to love your wife as Christ loved the church, and if you're failing in that, you're habitually sinning. That means if you know that, woman, you're supposed to reverence your husband as Christ, as, as the church, you know, reverences Christ and serves him, and if you aren't doing that, you're habitually sinning. You may not be an alcoholic, but you might be a foodaholic. And then you may habitually overeat. That's sin. Did you know that the Bible lists gluttony right in there with drunkenness and fornication? Ephesians chapter 5. Somebody says, but I just can't help it. Well, see, that's what the alcoholic says. The alcoholic just can't help it. He just can't control it. You never accidentally ate anything in your life. Everything you ever ate, you made a decision to do it. So it's habitual sin. So I don't believe that this verse is there talking about habitual sin. Well, then how can you understand this? What does the Scripture say when it says, Whosoever is born of God does not commit sin? Well, the only part of you that is born of God is your spirit. Your body is not born of God. Your soul is not born of God. They have been purchased, but we are still waiting on the redemption of the purchased possession. And that terminology is used in Ephesians and Romans chapter 8 and other places. We have been purchased, but the only part of us that is redeemed right now, the only part that is born of God is the Spirit. And Jesus verified that in John chapter 3 when he was preaching about being born again to Nicodemus. He said, that which is born of the flesh is flesh, that which is born of the Spirit is spirit. When you get born again, it's your spirit that gets born again. That's the only part of you that is born of God. And what this scripture is saying is that your spirit cannot sin. Your spirit does not sin. When you sin, you sin in your emotional or in your physical body, usually the combination of the two, but your spirit is not contaminated by it. When you get born again, God takes this spirit that was within you that was dead. That means separated from God. It was corrupt with sin. It was totally just, it was rotten. God takes that rotten spirit out of you, that dead spirit, places within you a new born-again spirit that Galatians chapter 4 says is the spirit of his dear son sent into your heart, crying, Abba, Father. And 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 17 says, He that is uh, joined unto the Lord is one spirit. My born-again spirit is molecule for molecule and ounce for ounce, if there are such things in the spiritual realm. It's, it's identical to Jesus. It is Jesus' spirit resurrected in me. Everybody follow that? My spirit is as Jesus is. It's pure, it's holy, Ephesians 4, 24. It's created in righteousness and true holiness. It is as he is, 1 John 4, 17. And that spirit part of us, once it's cleansed and purged, and once you're born again like that, Ephesians chapter 1 says you're sealed with the Holy Spirit. And this seal doesn't mean like a stamp of authority, but rather it's talking about like when you seal a jar, when you make preserves. You've got it in that airtight jar, and then you put an airtight seal over the top so that no contaminants can get inside and destroy or rot what's in there. Your spirit was created in righteousness and true holiness. It cannot sin, and it's sealed with the Holy Spirit so that whenever you do sin and fall short of the glory of God, your spirit isn't stained by that. Your spirit retains its righteousness, its right standing with God regardless of what you do. Well, that's a tremendous statement. Now, a lot of our religion will keep us from receiving that because we say, wait a minute, brother, I cannot believe this because what you're saying is I can go live like the devil and I'm still righteous in the sight of God. Well, that's an, that's an extreme, but technically that's true, that your actions do not change your right standing with God. Now, here's what happens. That does not mean that you can just go live in sin because if you continue to live in sin, if you yield your body... To Satan. Romans chapter 6, verse 16 says, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourself, servants to obey his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. If you yield your members to Satan and obey him by living in sin, 
Satan is eventually going to harden your heart to God to such a degree. He's going to deaden you to the voice of God. You're going to get to where you persist in sin that Satan's ultimate goal for every person is to steal, kill, and destroy. To steal God's salvation, to kill you not only physically but spiritually, and to just literally destroy you in this life and in the life to come. And Satan is going to bring you to a place where if at all possible, he's going to have you renounce your salvation. You cannot sin your salvation away. If you could, which sin is it that's going to make you sin it away? Well, it has to be the big sins, right? I mean, uh, you know, the big ones, because all of us sin in little things. Well, the Bible says in James chapter 2, verse 10, that if you keep the whole law and yet offend in one point, you become guilty of all. I mean, if you sin, you need a Savior. And if you say that sin's going to cause you to lose your salvation, you just can't say that a person can live in sin and still be saved and still be in right standing with God. A person that says that is going to have to put sins in categories and say, well, it's just the big ones. You can't do any of the big sins and still be in right standing because all of us sin and come short every single day. Again, what is sin? Sin is not only the things you're doing that are wrong, but according to James 4, 17, sin is what you know to do good and you aren't doing it. Sin is what you haven't yet obtained unto. And I guarantee you there's not a one of us in here that have obtained to everything that God has shown us. So all of us are sinning and coming short if you use God's Word as a standard. And if sin changes your right standing with God, if sin makes you unholy and until you repent and get back into right standing, you cannot expect God to move in your life, then nobody in here could ever be in fellowship with God. You know why God uses people with problems in their lives? Because he doesn't have anybody else to use. We all got problems, amen. We all sin and come short of the glory of God. God's never had anybody qualified working for him yet, and you aren't going to be the first one. Man, this is tremendous. See, the, our fellowship with God, Ephesians, I mean, uh, John chapter 4, verse 24 says, God is a spirit, and those who worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. Why must we worship him in spirit and in truth? Because the spirit part of you is cleansed, sanctified, holy, pure, it's righteous, and it's as he is. It's the only part of you that's worthy to really come into the presence of God. That's the reason we must worship him in spirit and in truth. And did you know that that spirit retains its righteousness and holiness? It cannot sin. It is not defiled by sin. Your spirit retains its righteousness and holiness even though your physical man and your emotional realm doesn't. It gets defiled and contaminated. Does that mean that you can just live a split life where you, you say, well, I'm holy, I'm righteous in Christ Jesus, and so therefore I'm going to go live like the devil? See, this is... This is what they accuse Paul of constantly. Paul, I can show you at least four times in the Scriptures where he would answer this thing and say, so that we continue in sin so that grace may abound? God forbid. Did you know if you aren't being asked the question, if people don't come up to you and say, are you saying that you can just live in sin and be anything you want and God still love you? If you aren't being asked that question, you haven't preached the gospel. Paul was preaching the gospel and people constantly asked him that because they were misunderstanding it. And Paul's answer was, God forbid. No, that's not what I'm saying. There's a number of reasons. The first one is, when you really are born again, you do not want to live in sin. A person who wants to live in sin was never born again. And it says that in context right here in the first, chap first John chapter 3. In verse 3, it talks about... Beloved, we don't know what we're going to be, but we know that when he will appear, we're going to be like him, for we will see him as he is. And then in verse 3, it says, Every man, that didn't mean most or, or many, but it says, Every man that hath this hope in him purifieth himself even as he is pure. If you're truly born again, your desire is to purify yourself and to live for God. Now, you may be doing a poor job of it. Matter of fact, religion, condemnation, preaching to you, don't do this and don't do that, will actually hinder you in living a holy life. It'll cause you to live in sin. I hadn't got time to explain that, but the Scripture says that I was alive without the law once, but when the commandment came, sin revived, and I died out of Romans chapter 7. Sin actually took occasion by the commandment. When somebody says, thou shalt not, this old carnal nature rises up and says, I shall, praise God, and it wants to do it. So the more you have legalism preached to you, it actually strengthens sin in your life. So you may be living a poor life. Uh, you may not be living a very holy standard because of a number of different things. But if you're truly born again, you want to live a holy life. It's your desire to live for God. 
And when you hear the truth, the truth doesn't set you free to sin. It'll set you free from sin. It'll make people humble themselves. You know, I minister on this all across the country, and it's developed to a place to where when I minister like I'm ministering today and minister about that you're righteous and that you're holy and that you're pure, I've seen this happen so many times that I now just automatically do it, that after I get through, I give people an opportunity to stand up and confess their sin and get straight. And I start calling out things like homosexuality. I ask people to stand up and admit that they've been committing adultery on their mate. I've asked people that have been committing incest to stand up, and we start just nailing these sins and having people repent. And did you know that without exception, people, man, start standing up? I mean, personal things. They start standing up and coming free. It's just exactly what the Bible says. It's the goodness of God that leads man to repentance. I see more people repent. I see more people set free through preaching on the goodness of God than you ever do by beating them down and telling them how sorry they are. Man, it's the goodness of God. Once a person understands, man, God is so good. You mean he would love me that he's done all of this for me? It causes people to want to lay down their life for the sake of the Lord. I believe in holiness, but I believe in holiness as a byproduct of relationship with God, not as a means to relationship to God. I believe that a person will have holiness in their life, but it'll come as a byproduct. If you are using holiness to try and obtain right standing with God, then it's going to profit you nothing. It's going to frustrate you and make your Christianity a drag, boring, hard, difficult. Salvation is totally the work of God. It's your spirit that was born again. It cannot sin. And man, if you understand this, see, this will give you tremendous boldness in the sight of God. One of Satan's biggest temptations, our biggest weapons against us, is guilt and condemnation. I believe that it's natural within a person. Romans chapter 1 says that God has revealed himself from heaven against all unrighteousness and ungodliness of men, so that even his eternal power in God has is understood by the creatures made. So that whether a person has ever heard the gospel or not, there's an intuitive knowledge on the inside of them of right and wrong, and our heart goes to condemning us or else excusing us. And it says that in Romans chapter 2. So there's this just natural knowledge of right and wrong, guilt and condemnation. And then it's, it's uh, undergirded. It's built up through uh, our upbringing. And the sad thing to say is that religion, by and large, is probably the biggest source of guilt and condemnation in the world today because they're preaching instead of the gospel, the New Testament, they're preaching the Old Testament law, wrath and condemnation. And man, many people have developed this attitude that if they come to church and if they leave feeling good instead of depressed and beat down and discouraged, they haven't been to church. I've had people actually come up and say, man, unless you step all over my toes, I just don't feel like I've been preached to. They've developed this masochist mentality when it comes to religion. They enjoy being beat down in religion. There's people that enjoy that kind of stuff. So anyway, religion comes along and just makes us feel rotten and completely unworthy and condemned. See, Satan uses these things to put wrong attitudes and values on the inside of us. And then once we're programmed up here in our mind, the devil can leave most of us alone and go on because we'll condemn ourselves. Every time we do something wrong, boy, we just beat ourselves down. We, we grovel in the dirt and all of these things. Boy, the truth of the gospel is that through Jesus Christ we've been cleansed and we can come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in the time of need, what it says in Hebrews 4.16. And I tell you, it'll liberate you from the dominion of sin. It will not set you free to sin. You know, it's really frustrating trying to teach this in such a short period of time because i got a thousand things I'd like to answer and I haven't got time to answer them this morning. But I just want to make this clear that I am not advocating sin. Sin will destroy you. But there was a twofold aspect to sin. Sin was a transgression against God, worthy of judgment and punishment. But God put your judgment and punishment upon Jesus. 2 Corinthians 5.21 says, God made him who knew no sin to be made sin for us, that we might be made the righteousness of God in him. Jesus took your punishment. Yes, God is holy. Yes, sin is an offense against God. And sin needs to be judged. But sin was judged in the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. And your sin has been dealt with. Not only past tense sins, but future tense sins. It's all been dealt with. Somebody said, now I'm not sure God can forgive sins before you do them. Well, you better hope that he can because you were forgiven 2,000 years ago before you ever committed any sins. And if God can't forgive sins in a future tense, you're in trouble. Jesus has never died for sin since. It was done 2,000 years ago. The sin question has been dealt with by God. 
Does that mean that we can just go live in sin? God forbid, because see, there was a second uh, bondage to sin, and that was what I call a horizontal relationship. Uh, Romans 6, 16, Know ye not that to whom ye yield yourselves servants to obey, his servants ye are to whom ye obey, whether of sin unto death or of obedience unto righteousness. Even though God's not going to bring judgment on my, upon me because my spirit is now cleansed and it cannot sin, if I go live in sin, Satan is going to bring judgment on me. I open up a door to Satan, I guarantee you he's going to come in and steal, kill, and destroy. I'm not going to experience the joy and the peace of the Lord. I'm not going to be happy. I'm not going to be prosperous but not because God withdrew from me because of sin. If he did, which sin is it God would withdraw over? God does not withdraw from you because of sin. If you made Jesus the Lord of your life, sin's been dealt with, you've got a right standing with God, but Satan is going to condemn you to the max. He's going to come into your life, steal, kill, and destroy, and so you've got to quit living in sin and quit giving Satan those inroads into your life. Holiness is important, but holiness does not change your relationship with God. It doesn't improve your relationship with God. A lack of holiness does not deteriorate your relationship with God. But a lack of holiness will certainly give Satan tremendous inroad into your life, and your relationship with God will deteriorate because Satan will start blinding you and deceiving you and stealing from you. Holiness is not a prerequisite for right standing with God. If it is, you'd have never gotten born again. Amen? If you receive salvation, the greatest gift of all, when you were yet a sinner, Christ died for you, well then much more now being justified by grace, we shall be saved from wrath through him. Romans chapter 5, verse 8 and 9. If you can accept that God loved you while you were a sinner, that you got born again, much more now that you're born again, should we have boldness to enter into the presence of God without sin consciousness? But most of us have a tremendous sin consciousness because we haven't renewed our mind. We don't see ourselves in the Spirit. We've not made a clear distinction between spirit, soul, and body. We look at ourselves in the mirror and we perceive ourselves in the emotional realm and we think that's the way we are. God doesn't see you that way. God looks not on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. God sees you in Christ Jesus and you're righteous, you're holy, you're pure. That spirit cannot sin. It is not contaminated by sin, by your failures, your inadequacies. And if you understand this, Proverbs 28.1 says, The righteous will be bold as a lion. Man, if you understand this, it'll give you boldness to come right under the throne of God. I mean, even when you've blown it, when everybody else is on your case, you can come right to God with boldness because, see, God sees you differently. God sees his workmanship. When God created the heavens and the earth, he said, let there be light, and he separated the light from the darkness, and the scripture says God saw the light, that it was good. He didn't look on the darkness. He looked at what he made. Did you know there's still darkness? There's still things wrong in each one of our lives, but did you know God doesn't see us that way? God sees what he made. God looks at you, his workmanship. He sees you in the spirit. God looks at you that way, and God sees you righteous, holy, and pure. And if you could ever begin to start seeing yourself that way, did you know you could begin to walk with God? Because now you'd be agreed. And you could begin to start enjoying the fellowship and the relationship that Jesus died to purchase, not because of your performance, but because of your faith in Jesus, because his performance was perfect. Isn't that good news? Praise God. Boy, that's powerful. I tell you, I talked as fast as I can, and we didn't touch the tip of the iceberg. I'm going to be back next week. I'll be here next Sunday, and we'll be teaching on this again. And I really encourage you to come. This is the kind of thing that you are not going to get hearing it one time. You need to get this over and over and uh, get established in it. Amen? Father, we thank you for your word, and we just praise you, Father, for the truth of the gospel. The good news that sin is not being imputed, imputed unto us because you put it on Jesus, that he became sin for us so that we might be made the righteousness of God. Father, we thank you for that. And I ask you for each one of us, that, Father, this would become a real revelation to us. That, Father, we would really get hold of this and understand what it means to our life personally. Father, for those that are suffering under feelings of depression, discouragement, guilt, condemnation, I ask you that today, Father, they'd turn their eyes from themselves and turn it unto a Savior. And they'd see that through Jesus they've been cleansed and that they're pure and that they're truly holy. Father, we thank you for that. Praise you, Lord Jesus. We hope that your heart has been quickened by hearing the Word of God through this message. 
Remember, Andrew Womack Ministries operates a helpline that you can call for prayer and information at 719-635-1111. We have a ministry website at www.awmi.net and you can write the ministry at P.O. Box 3333, Colorado Springs 80934. Until next time, we pray that you will reach out by faith and receive everything that is yours through God's grace.